Okay, dear participant, as Vice President of the European Law Institute, it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you all to this webinar on regulating AI, a first analysis of the European Commission's proposal. You are over 200 participants that have registered for this online webinar, which probably underlines how important you weigh the EU proposal at hand. But before presenting our distinguished panelists, let me just remind you that you will be able to ask questions by using the uh, Q&A sections, the chat having been disabled. And do not wait until the end uh, to pose your questions in the Q&A sections, but as soon as you are ready to pose one, uh, please go on and, and we will then gather all the questions. On 21st April 2021, the EU Commission has published a communication on fostering a European approach to artificial intelligence, in which it presents its strategy. And as part of this strategy, there is an annex presenting the coordinated plan on artificial intelligence 2021 review with a lot of strategic presentations and timelines. As part of the EU strategy, there is, however, also a proposal for regulation for a regulation laying down harmonized rules on artificial intelligence, the so-called, already so-called Artificial Intelligence Act. This proposed AI Act is the object of tonight's webinar. There might be also some references, of course, to the nine annexes to this AI Act, which have been published at the same time and which include, among other elements, a list of union harmonization legislation based on the new legislative framework and of course several further lists referred to by the AI Act. To discuss this Artificial Intelligence Act, which will undoubtedly occupy us all for sure a couple of months, we will have a short presentation by each of our panelists and then about 20-25 minutes of slot for Q&A. Tonight, we have the pleasure to have among us first, Mr. Gabriele Mazzini. Uh, he is legal and policy officer at the unit of artificial, artificial intelligence policy development and coordination at the DG for communications uh, networks, content and technology of the European Commission. Gabriele Mazzini has focused on legal and policy questions raised by new technologies since at least August 2017. He co-authored the white paper on artificial intelligence of February 2020 and the proposal for the artificial intelligence that we are discussing today. That's why we are so pleased and honored to have him here among us. As EU official, he also served in the European Parliament Legal Services and at the Court of Justice between 21 and 23. Between 2010 and 2017, Gabriele Manzini held several positions also in the private sector in New York. He holds an LLM from Harvard Law School, a PhD in Italian and Comparative Criminal Law from the University of Pavia, and a law degree from the Catholic University of Milan. Of, Milan. of course, today he's here as a member of this DG for communication networks and a part of one of the drafter um, uh, of these uh, AI Act. Uh, Gabriele Mazzini will give us now a brief presentation of the European Commission's proposal and I'm pleased uh, to give him the floor. Thank you very much Pascal for the, for the kind introduction. And, uh, and it's my pleasure to be here with you and, uh, and present our work on the proposal for um, the regulation. Um, so I've prepared uh, three slides. Uh, I'll try indeed to keep it short to the, to the eight minutes and uh, to present a couple of um, the key concepts and provisions uh, for, the, for, the, for the proposal. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a key, uh, probably also well-known and uh, thoroughly discussed concept, uh, the risk-based approach. So the Commission 
um, is of the view that uh, the technology is beneficial and it should be encouraged. At the same time, it's important to adopt a balanced legal framework, balanced in the sense that it should not, of course, stifle beneficial uses and it should generate uh, the needed trust to make sure that the technology is widespread. Risk-based approach also means that we're not dealing here with the regulation of the technology as such, but uh, of regulation of specific instances or use cases, as, as we call them, um, where we think that a certain regulatory intervention is needed. Uh, that regulatory intervention, on the other hand, is not equal uh, across the board. So if we start here from this pyramid, um, so the lower end is really the cases uh, of AI applications that we think bear minimal or no risk. This is way uh, the, the greatest majority of AI applications, and those are not affected by any means from the regulation. We are talking here, for instance, about spam filters or AI systems that uh, could be used in a factory to optimize processes. The higher level, the, the, yellow, the yellow band, refers to those cases of AI that we think cause some sort of transparency risk. So we don't want to necessarily talk about low risks, uh, as one may think in opposition to the high risk category, but rather so of risk that are related to the fact that uh, there is a lack of, um, or a need, I would say, of disclosure of the fact that there is an AI uh, in, in, at stake. Examples are the bots. Uh, when you talk to a customer service, as you're not sure whether you're talking to a computer rather than, than a person, or situations like where you enter into a shop and there is an emotional recognition system to see how, say, you react to a certain uh, uh, merchandise on display. And we classify also in this category, also the deep fakes. So we think in these situations, the risks are primarily addressed by uh, no obligation of the user of the system to notify of the existence of the system to the persons that are affected. Um, the bulk of the regulation focuses on the high risk. Uh, high risk, uh, systems are permitted. However, they must comply with a number of requirements for, for them, uh, five requirements, we'll, we'll see them uh, in a short minute, and they should be subject to an ex-ante conformity assessment procedure. Uh, finally, at the very tip of the, of the pyramid, there are situations, uh, AI systems, um, we call uh, prohibited artificial intelligence practices, where we think that the risk is simply not acceptable and therefore those systems and those practices should be uh, simply prohibited. Now, uh, there are four categories there. There's actually one category where there are some exceptions and, and I understand uh, perhaps some speakers will, will take a look at it a little later. Um, if you know, go to the next slide. Um, so here we are in the field of the high risk. So what are the high-risk systems? Uh, there are two major blocks, two major categories. The first block is the systems that are um, safety components of products that are already subject of existing legislation and are subject to third-party conformity assessment. So to give you an example, you're aware of uh, the fact that uh, in the EU, there is a vast key of product safety legislation, whether it's about medical devices, whether it's about machinery. And we are talking here about actually those products that are subject to uh, so-called the new legislative framework uh, approach. We're not talking here about the old approach. For those, there is a separate conversation to be, to be, to be made. So with regard to those categories of products, uh, if the AI plays the role of a safety component, then and the product itself is subject to third-party conformity assessment under that uh, sectoral legislation. So under the medical device regulation, the machine regulation, the toys directive, uh, and so on, then the AI is high risk. Another category of high-risk AI systems are what we call so-called standalone AI systems, um, meaning these are systems that uh, are basically not components of products. 
Uh, and in this situation, we have identified a number of areas. There are eight areas that you find here in the slide. Um, where under each area, uh, there are use cases. Uh, those areas and those use cases are mentioned in the Annex 3. And um, this is just, I should say, uh, our initial proposal. Uh, one of the features of, of this regulation is that uh, we think that these uh, use cases may be updated uh, over time as uh, new applications, new uses may emerge, and so also new risks. What cannot be updated are the areas. So the areas, the ones you see here, biometric identification and categorization, critical infrastructure, educational training, employment, and so on. These are areas that uh, we think should be decided by the legislator. But the um, use cases under each area may be, um, uh, there are, well, there are a number of use cases which we proposed at the very beginning, but we think that the Commission should be able to maintain the instrument flexible to add use cases as time goes by. Um, next slide. Here, um, so I want to give you a sense of the requirements for those systems. So those systems we've just seen, whether they are components of products or so-called standalone, they must comply with five requirements. Um, those are requirements for the system per se. Um, here we are following, um, so essentially this regulation is a uh, NLF regulation, is a new legislative framework regulation in the sense that it has established a number of requirements. We don't call them essential requirements, which is the typical formulation of NLF, for instance, the Blue Guide. We call them simply requirements, but, but we are talking essentially about the same thing. So they are requirements for the system as such that the system needs to meet. And those requirements constitute sort of the objectives that the system, uh, the, the, the system, the, the product needs to meet. But we don't want to enter into the specific technical solutions that the providers, the manufacturers, or the high risk AI systems need to uh, determine themselves and need to determine themselves uh, according to the NLF approach, which means um, there, there will be standards. They may also adopt uh, individual technical specifications, but in a way, one of the greatest, uh, we think, uh, achievements of the NLF approach has been that of allowing that flexibility to manufacturers to indeed choose the technical means by which to comply with the requirements. These five requirements are those that were identified by the high level expert group. So on the data set, high quality data set, documentation of the system, transparency, human oversight, uh, robustness, accuracy, and cybersecurity. And an important qualification about these five requirements is that they should be, uh, their compliance should be ensured by the provider according to a risk management system and in light of the intended purpose of the AI system. So that means that those requirements may be somewhat, I should say, articulated or uh, slightly differentiated when, uh, and, and so they can be adapted to systems, which this is a horizontal regulation, but the systems of course may have different needs. So the way of compliance could slightly uh, vary to the extent that the systems may have different needs. Of course, if you're talking about a robotic application, it's different from an assisted decision-making system and so on. But the requirements are those, uh, they just have to be complied with in accordance with um, the risk management system and in light of the intended purpose. I think I can stop it here and then we can uh, perhaps address questions later if that's uh, possible. Thank you very much. I hope it will be possible. Uh, thank you very much for this very clear presentation of the structure and the main feature. I have now the pleasure to give the floor to Professor Christiane Wenderhorst. Uh, as you know, she is the president of the European Law Institute. She is professor at the University of Vienna, co-head of its Department of Innovation and Digitalization in Law, and from 2018 to 19, she co-chaired the Data Ethics Commission 
of the German federal government and is the head of the bioethics committee at the Austrian Federal Chancellery. She has published many books and articles and is one of the leading experts, I would say, in the field of data economy, digitalization and the law. She is here today because she's one of the co-reporter, uh, no, uh, one of the, yeah, co-reporter or co-author of the uh, ELI response to the public consultation. And she will deal, as you can see from her slide already, on the second part of the ELI response to the public consultation. Uh, Christiane, you have the floor. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Pascal, for the kind introduction. There's just one small correction I have to make. I'm just a very simple member of the Austrian Bioethics Committee. So, um, but thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction indeed. Um, as Pascal already said, um, I will uh, give a very brief and preliminary analysis of the draft against the background of the ELI's response to the public consultation. That response was also jointly by the reporters of the ELI project on artificial intelligence in administration and the European reporter of the ALI ELI uh, project on principles for a data economy. And so one of the uh, major points and uh, one of the focuses of our response was that uh, we kind of um, pleaded for uh, a solution that would square the circle of a high level of protection that avoids too much red tape. So that was uh, one of our major points we made. And as Gabriele has already described, we believe that with the risk-based approach with the draft and regulation has now taken, um, this is uh, a, a very well uh, uh, achieved. And so this risk-based approach, in our view, is uh, something that is uh, very positive. And Gabriele has already described the details in much nicer colors and colors that are much closer indeed um, to what the German Data Ethics Commission had initially proposed. These colors, which you find on my slide, are still the colors I copied from the commission website. So by and large, I think that risk-based approach is very positive. Of course, as is uh, the case uh, so often, the details still require discussion. For example, we see that emotion recognition systems as such are only subject to a transparency obligation. They're only qualified as high-risk applications when used by, for example, law enforcement authorities or a migration authorities, that is certainly something one could debate, but by and large, uh, uh, this risk-based approach is extremely welcome, I believe. Our response also stressed the need to link this new AI regime and the safety risk dimension of AI to existing product safety legislation. When we look more closely at the risks posed by AI, we see that there are like two types of risks. The one risk, uh, the one type of risk uh, which the uh, proposal calls safety risks, we call them physical risks, but we basically mean the same. That is death, personal injury, damage to property, uh, and so on, caused by unsafe products and activities involving AI. And the other type of risk that is posed by AI is what the proposal calls fundamental rights risks, and we call social risks, which is discrimination, manipulation, exploitation, loss of control, and other um, uh, uh, phenomena caused by inappropriate decisions and exercise of power based on AI. Now, the one type would more be caused by autonomous vehicles, robots, the other type would more be caused by recruitment software and similar applications. And we stress the need to align this with the digital fitness check of existing safety legislation. Now, we see here that the draft regulation overall takes a product safety approach for AI, 
irrespective of whether the AI is embedded or non-embedded, or also when it comes uh, within the software as a service school. We believe this is, or I believe at least, this is uh, absolutely the right approach. It's so important uh, to integrate this uh, AI uh, regime into the existing product safety legislation and uh, to take that safety approach and not, for example, a services approach. And I believe the draft regulation extremely elegantly links the new AI specific requirements um, with this integrity regulation while also covering fundamental rights risks. So I think really I analyzed this interplay and I think it's really a masterpiece of drafting and a uh, uh, very positive. Uh, uh, that is used as my first reaction. And last but not least, the ELI's 2020 response also suggested the prohibition of a set of blacklisted unfair algorithmic practices. And we explicitly mentioned discrimination, exploitation of vulnerabilities, total surveillance, and manipulation. And so we are delighted to see uh, that set of prohibited AI practices in Article 5. However, when looking at the details, I have to confess that I have still a lot of questions. Um, so just to start with, um, discrimination maybe might have been mentioned also. Of course, the prohibition of discrimination follows from other law, but it might have been important to mention in this regard. And then there is a number of restrictions which one could um, discuss. So, for example, when it comes to manipulation, um, why is that restricted to physical or psychological harm? What about a detrimental economic decisions? What about voting behavior? We see the influence which social networks and AI um, has on people's behavior, whether people go rioting on the streets or not. So maybe that could be reconsidered. And um, also um, here we have um, uh, uh, a restriction when it comes to the exploitation of vulnerabilities to group specific vulnerabilities. So just vulnerabilities that are specific to a group of persons due to their age, physical or mental disability. So again, uh, we see with many AI applications that due to data analysis, it's possible to exploit very, very individual vulnerabilities that do not necessarily um, uh, 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 coincide with group vulnerabilities uh, defined by age or similar characteristics. So um, maybe that is also a little bit too narrow. And here again, when it comes to social scoring, of course, the, 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 the public authorities case where public authorities use social scoring, as we see uh, is the case in China, for example. That is, of course, um, uh, the, the most prominent case, and I absolutely understand why it has been mentioned in the very first case. But maybe we should discuss whether similar uh, uh, prohibitions should also um, uh, be imposed when it comes to gatekeeper services, for example. And then uh, last but not least, we have the uh, uh, use of real-time remote biometric identification. And in fact, I wasn't able to put everything on that slide because it's very lengthy. There are many paragraphs devoted to real-time remote biometric identification. So when you look more closely at what is in there, it, it, it becomes apparent that it's a little bit an alien element in Article 5 because it's not really about a prohibited practice, but rather about a heavily regulated practice. So that might have better been placed into a separate title. And of course, when you look at the details, there are also many questions why the restriction to real-time practices, for example, um, uh, why not post-biometrical uh, 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 identification, and is law enforcement the only problematic purpose? 
So um, uh, my time is over. Overall, I have to say that again, it's the background of our response. My personal first reaction is a very positive one. However, there, as always, the devil lies in the detail, and I believe there are a lot of details to be discussed over the coming months, and I'm looking forward to that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christiane, for this very um, thoughtful uh, analysis. Uh, and, and now, uh, without ado, I will uh, give the floor to Professor Jens Peter Schneider. Uh, he is professor at the University of Freiburg in Germany, of course. I'm sitting here in Fribourg in Switzerland. And one of the co-reporter of the ELI project on AI and public administration, just mentioned by Christiane Venderos before. He is professor for public law and European administrative information and infrastructure law at the Institute of Media and Information Law. He has been visiting professor in several universities, including Columbia Law School and Sao Paulo. He's the author of many books and articles and is involved in many projects on energy law and digital application in administration. And uh, he has also, as mentioned, co-authored the ELI response to the public consultation on the AI Act. And he will give us now a brief analysis of the proposal and it's important for the ELI's work. And uh, Jens Peter, you have the floor. You're still muted. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Pascal, for your very kind in uh, introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, my presentation will investigate three questions which you can read on your screen. The answer to my first question is a rather simple yes. As, as displayed, uh, the relevant definitions explicitly mention public authorities and Christiane already mentioned some of the topics as well. But our conformity assessments, which are the focus of my other questions, also required for public AI systems. Again, the answer is yes, but a little less straightforward. Conformity assessments are only required for high-risk AI systems, as we learned from Gabriele Mazzini. Many of such high-risk AI systems are components of products regulated under EU health and safety law. AI-specific assessments of such components shall be integrated into existing conformity procedures, as already mentioned by Christiane. This alternative will probably be less relevant to public AI systems. However, it serves as the procedural model for the more relevant alternative. That alternative applies to standalone AI systems classified as high risk in accordance to the areas and use cases. The high risk areas highlighted in red clearly uh, are clearly specific administrative tasks and also the other areas can be connected to duties of public administrations and authorities. Turning to the ex ante conformity assessment procedure itself and the subsequent market surveillance governance, I will try to present the complex framework in an evolving slide. I start with the internal conformity assessment, which serves as a standard procedure because it applies to the majority of high-risk areas under Annex 3. It is called internal as it is only implemented by the AI systems provider himself or in certain exceptional cases by its user. The assessment has two major components. The first one is a quality management system which comprises several features. The most important features are separate systems for risk analysis and management, as well as for establishing post-market monitoring. The second assessment component is a technical documentation. That documentation shall provide information for surveillance authorities on one end side and to some extent for users of the AI system on the other side. As you can see, the documentation covers important elements of a quality management system as well as additional information, for instance, about foreseeable risks to specific objects, like fundamental rights. 
concerning the exposed surveillance system of the AI system, the starting point are duties mainly to offer providers to regularly update their risk analysis and to adapt risk management measures based on the monitoring of a deployed AI system. If an operator identifies in the post-market monitoring a serious incident or animal functioning of an AI system relevant to the protection of fundamental rights, they have to inform the respective national market surveillance authority. And that authority is then in charge to take enforcement measures. However, such malfunctioning may also fall under the jurisdiction of other sector-specific national authorities. If an AI system is used by the Commission or an EU agency, the European Data Protection Supervisor is assigned as the component, uh, competent market surveillance authority. In order to guarantee uniform application of a draft regulation, the national market surveillance authorities, as well as the EDPS, shall be, new, shall be members of a new European AI board. This board exhibits features similar to, similar to EU agencies in the field of data protection or telecom regulation, or like the European Board for Digital Services under the proposed Digital Services Act. The final component of a proposed AI governance structure is the Commission itself. Besides various powers for concretizing the general legal obligations, the Commission has the, AI, the final word in any conflict among the various administrative bodies mentioned before, in a so-called safeguard procedure. In addition, the draft regulation provides for a more demanding external assessment, um, but only in case of AI systems for biometric identification of natural persons. In this variant, the internal assessment by the provider is independently assessed by notified bodies. These notified bodies are private entities who are de designated by the natural a national supervisory authority acting as notifying authority. As already mentioned, the European AI board mirrors other EU agencies. It's not noteworthy that some of these, like especially the existing EU data protection board or the proposed EU board for digital services may also have sector-specific responsibilities for AI systems. Thus, similar overlapping responsibilities may arise as mentioned at the national level. Consequently, cross-sectorial coordination will be a major challenge on both levels of the European admi administrative space. From my very first analysis, I have the impression, not a final word, that the draft AI regulation as well as the draft Digital Services Act address these challenges only to a limited extent and mainly at national level. Another open question which needs further elaboration is the question whether the proposed conformity assessment framework, which mirrors product safety governance structures, is fully appropriate for AI systems deployed by public authorities, which is different to private AI usage. At the moment, the draft regulation provides for a publicly accessible EU database with some basic information about such AI systems. This is a very good starting point, but the rule of law, as well as the democratic legitimization of public administration may require additional safeguards for independent expertise and public participation. This might be even more important as public authorities have a significantly stricter obligation compared to private AI users to minimize any risk which is addressed in various rules 
uh, of the draft regulation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jens Peter Schneider, for this uh, very interesting and challenging also presentation of uh, the very complex aspect of uh, assessment and, and surveillance and post surveillance, and also the uh, uh, different perspective that will certainly trigger a lot of questions also in practice later on. I have now the pleasure to give the floor to uh, Marc. Clément, he is a presiding judge at the Administrative Court of Lyon in France, and he is a, also co-reporter of the ELI project on AI and public administration with Jens Peter Schneider. He is also co-author of the response to the pub, ELI uh, to, response to the public consultation, and he will deal with the link between the ELI project and uh, the AI Act proposal. And I'm sure he will add a, a, another, yet another layer on this uh, difficult but important understanding of this proposal. Marc uh, Clément, you have the floor. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Pascal. I'm um, very uh, happy to, to be here to discuss this very um, new proposal and um, in a very complex field. And um, this is uh, for sure a very complex uh, text and um, it's difficult to address everything um, in, um, in uh, such a limited uh, time. But um, I, I, I'm trying to, to, to share some questions uh, with you, um, which I think um, are um, important. Um, the, the, the first uh, issue is um, uh, looking at the, um, at the scope of the uh, regulation uh, is to stress the fact that um, this is a, a technology-based uh, regulation because uh, uh, everything depends on uh, the technology that is used uh, um, in Annex 1 of the regulation. And um, this, this means that you have a very clear list of techniques um, that are uh, supposed to cover um, AI issues. Um, I, I'd like to, to stress the fact that, um, specifically in the domain of public administration, uh, we have uh, seen uh, many um, tools that are used um, and that are uh, tools uh, automa like automated decision-making tools that are not necessarily uh, linked or using these techniques. I just give an, a well-known um, case in France because it took uh, because it has um, raised quite uh, quite a lot of public debate and um, and many uh, many uh, discussions on that. Uh, this is a tool, Parcoursup, uh, that was used for the um, allocation of places in universities for students. Uh, if you look at the tool uh, itself, this is um, something that is used uh, for uh, high school uh, students and uh, the, 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 the steps to the uh, university. And uh, uh, if you look at the, the, the techniques used, it's probably not covered by um, Annex 1. Uh, in this uh, context, because we, these are not statistical tools, not necessarily uh, knowledge-based uh, uh, tools, and not um, uh, deep learning or neural nets um, approaches. Uh, so uh, the, the, the question is, uh, would the uh, scope based on the knowledge-based um, approach be, um, be uh, enough? This is the first, uh, first question. Uh, and as um, Jens Peter uh, said, uh, in public administration uh, and public law, uh, the administration has specific uh, specific uh, rules to uh, follow, and uh, the issues are probably a bit uh, more constrained in terms of legal and legality, and in in terms of. Um, uh, in terms of rules to be uh, followed by administration than in the, in the pri private sector. This is one first uh, issue. Second issue, um, the uh, added value of public participation. 
Uh, we believe in um, in the work we do with the AI in, in the domain of um, AI and public administration. That public participation is probably um, something uh, good in the context of um, of using um, public um, using AI uh, tools or automated decision systems in the context of public administration. Mm -hmm. Uh, first of all, um, what we can see is that uh, many of the uh, AI systems are operated by uh, potential high risk uh, AI systems are operated by public bodies, uh, potentially. And uh, in this context, um, the, 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 the first added value of public participation is to avoid uh, to avoid misunderstandings and to start a real and genuine process of transparency before putting the system into service, having the, 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 the possibility, uh, open the possibility for citizens to, uh, to have their say on the use of, of the tool. One thing. And uh, the other uh, added value of public debate is um, um, a dimension of um, of democracy and the possibility to uh, for citizens to understand what the administration is doing and i think it's in the context of um, uh, better administration in the context of um, uh, uh, challenging uh, issues for administrations i think this transparency and public debate part is probably um, a very important um, aspect of, of, of the things specifically in the domain of the new technologies um, we've seen that uh, for instance being in the context of uh, use of uh, gmos uh, public debates were also very strong uh, when it, when new technologies and uh, not necessarily ai are developed i think public debates are quite important so that's the second uh, point i wanted to make uh, Third point uh, for uh, public law uh, lawyers, uh, it's it's a it's a bit challenging to enter in the in the views of um, internal market issues and um, uh, in the uh, and applying it to uh, public administrations. It's probably uh, also more difficult if you're French with the tradition of uh, public law in uh, in France. But um, uh, but a few questions. Public bodies will be uh, potentially providers and users, uh, and in in many uh, aspects, when developing AI systems, they will be both. They they will be the provider, the one designing the system, not necessarily implementing it, but designing it and also the user um, uh, being the administration using the tools suppose for instance you you have a tool for uh, checking um, tax uh, declarations uh, in uh, tax administrations uh, this tool could very well be based on uh, deep learning and um, and uh, automatic assessments uh, this tool will be developed possibly by uh, third parties, but will be designed by the uh, administration and, um, and uh, used by the administration itself. The, the issue of the conformity assessment um, is, is crucial in this context. And I think that uh, the, 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 the point is that the, uh, the crucial aspect of it is less the technique that is involved rather than the way it is developed and implemented uh, by the administration as a user, as a user for serving citizens. So I, I see also a, a, a field where we, we need to have some reflection on, uh, on that. And the final, final slide, just uh, because I'm a judge, I think all of this is also very ch challenging for our judges because if we are supposing that the judges will have to control these, uh, these obligations, uh, we'll have to look at the uh, conformity assessments, whether they are performed co correctly. Uh, there is a, a, a very strong um, issue 
uh, of, um, of capacity of judges of, ta of tackling uh, the, these issues and also the need to go beyond um, uh, the uh, level, le levels of uh, control that are not uh, enough, such as um, manifest error of appreciation or Wednesbury test in, uh, in the context of common law. Uh, tackling complexity and technical uh, knowledge gap for judges is absolutely crucial in this context. And I, I just want, would like to finish with the quote of um, uh, judge of uh, Judge uh, Cranston in the in the Foster case in the UK, judges may be clever, but not that clever. That was that was said in the context of environmental law and uh, the complexity of the law and the complexity of the technique. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marc Clément, for these insightful uh, uh, aspects. And, and I'm sure that uh, among clever judges, you are certainly <laughs> a very clever judge. Um, uh, but the problem remains, of course. Uh, I have now the pleasure to give the floor to Professor Susanna Navas Navarro. She is full professor for private law and head of the Department of Private Law at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. In recent years, she de uh, has devoted herself to the study of the so-called digital law, in particular, the interplay between artificial intelligence and private law. And she has had a special focus recently on health and AI with a book in Spanish on this issue published this year, 21. Um, I, I will uh, not uh, mention the title in Spanish, uh, but it exists, <laughs> and as well as uh, a book uh, uh, on aspects of digitalizations, two books in fact, one in Spanish entitled Obras de Dominio Publico, and another one that has been published last year with Martin Ebers on algorithms and the law. And therefore, I'm really thrilled to hear what she has to say to us tonight. Susanna, you have the floor. Thank you very much for having me. I would like to start my, my statement highlighting that data is essential for innovation, especially for those artificial intelligence uh, systems uh, which make use of techniques and approaches involving machine learning as referred to in Article 3 of this proposal. In order to obtain innovative and also disruptive output, high quality data sets are important, which implies that they are of high value. In addition, as stated by the proposal, the existence of high quality data sets for training, validating and testing systems is essential to avoid or at least to reduce the existence of discriminatory biases. It is worth to note that in order to get high value and high quality data sets, it is necessary to have access to a huge amount of data. And data should be as varied as possible. Variety is a key element in this field. The greater the volume of data company has access to, the more accurate its predictions and correlations will be. And the greater its ability to train in the system in order to fit its objective. However, in Europe, companies cope with a, a scarcity of data. Therefore, the EU aims to facilitate the change of data with, between European companies so that they can innovate and be in a better position to compete with the United States, South Korea, China, uh, Israel or Japan. Wow. Hence the interest shown by the EU in achieving a free flow of data in the internal market. In this regard, relevant milestones are both the Open Data Directive uh, and the proposal for a European governance, governance data which concerns public information. But the impression that data flows in the digital uh, market is actually wrong since, since most of the information is controlled by persons or companies which either de facto or de jure decide what to do with uh, that information, who can have access to it and under which conditions. In so far, they decide to share it, which is less than obvious. Put simply, high value information remains outside the free flow of data that Europe intends to seek. Generally speaking, there are three uh, types of information. 
The first one concerns undisclosed information generated by a company or by the company's users or by its products. And this information can be protected using technological measures. It could also be protected by copyright or trade secret law. Uh, moreover, some of this information might be of a personal nature and be protected by the corresponding legislation. Secondly, information protected by copyright or related rights. Regarding this kind of information, the new directive on copyright and related rights in the digital single market has settled for an exception to the holder rights for text and data mining made by research organizations and cultural heritage institutions, as long as there is a non-commercial purpose. Even in this case, rights holders are allowed to implement security measures. Nevertheless, those who invest and innovate in artificial intelligence are um, essentially private uh, businesses. Many of them are startups and small and medium-sized enterprises. They have obviously a um, commercial purpose. So if a company intends to have access to information protected by copyright and related rights, it is necessary according to Article 4, Part 3 of this directive, to reach an agreement with the rights holder, which implies a high transactions cost. Rather, also, rather than stimulating uh, investment in high technology, actually this rule discourages it. On the other hand, the Open Data Directive uh, remarks the respect of third parties' IP rights over public information such as that belonging to the cultural heritage. And concerning research data as public information, openness depends on the fact that the organization decide to make them publicly available through repositories. And the third category of information is information available on internet and which is not protected by copyright law. Uh, however, the fact that copyright protection doesn't exist doesn't mean that uh, there are um, other legal instruments to protect it, such, for example, through technological measures or through contract, the so-called private ordering. Moreover, parasitic behaviors have increased due to the public domain digitization. In short, the European trend to create new um, intellectual property rights and the interpretation made by the Court of Justice of the European Union in order to protect as many works and as much information as possible means that most of these uh, works and information uh, that flows on the internet is protected, preventing that companies and startups have access to valuable data. So European companies face more obstacles than their foreign competitors if they intend to innovate based on machine learning. Uh, additionally, this situation is not particularly attractive for foreign companies in order to run a business and develop artificial intelligence projects in Europe. So the proposal at hand, however, insists both on innovation by small and medium-sized companies and on the removal of unjustified obstacles to the placing on the market or putting into service of high-risk AI systems. Albeit the main problem still exists, the lack of valuable data to which specific techniques can be applied in order to be considered of high-quality data. It turns out that, uh, on one hand, data flowing on internet is basically public information, and on the other hand, that only certain institutions may accept uh, hold the rights to carry out text and data mining, as long as, I said, they make a non-commercial use. So my question is how to innovate in Europe? Does it really exist a free flow of data? One of the proposal objectives is to ensure legal certainty to facilitate investments and innovation. However, the scarcity of data in the market is a barrier to investments and innovation. If we approach other legal systems, such as United States, Canada, South Korea, which allow the commercial use as purpose for text and data mining, European companies are at significant competitive disadvantage. So just in closing, I would like 
just to highlight that in my opinion there is within the EU politics an important tension between on the one hand intending to represent a world hub for the AI development and this proposal intends to be a worldwide model rule and on the other hand protecting information excessively. A legal regulation on AI uh, partly loses strength and relevance if data circulating on the internet has little or no value at all. Moreover, the risk of bias increases. Therefore, uh, in my opinion, if the European Union wants to have a prominent position in the development of projects based on uh, artificial intelligence, solutions must be sought and mechanisms envisaged to reduce this tension and it can be done with full respect to fundamental rights. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Susanna. Uh, it's very interesting. We began with policy issues with Gabriele Mazzini. We end also with policy issues on the other hand. But of course, in the middle, you have the flow of data to, uh, uh, to, to feed the algorithms and, and therefore to see what are the outcomes. So as one can see, we are here in a very complex uh, field with many intricacies and, and that is also to be seen in the uh, questions we got during your uh, presentation. But first of all, I'd like to thank all the panelists for the very challenging and interesting presentation. And let me maybe begin now with, with a couple of questions. Uh, you were able to read them, but you maybe don't know who will be asked to <laughs> answer the question. So uh, I, I, maybe I will begin with the first question that was posed this uh, evening. And, and that's uh, the question on the relationship between Article 5 of the AI Act and the UCPD. Uh, and the question that was raised by Christiane's uh, uh, point about manipulation of economic behavior by purchasing decisions, for instance, whether that would come under the UCPD and whether it is clear or not that Article 5 is, is precluding that or not, and what is the relation. So again, we have a, a problem of uh, intercoursing between two different acts. So maybe Christiane may try to answer that if you have any answer, and otherwise you can just throw the ball to Gabriele Manzini, because we hope he has an answer if you don't have one. Well, thank you so much, Pascal, and I hope the acoustics is better now when I use headphones and, and, and a microphone. So, um, in fact, Gabriele would be much better qualified to answer the question, but um, personally, I can't imagine that Article 5 precludes anything in the UCPD. Um, so definitely not uh, in the in the form as it currently stands, where uh, there is just reference to physical or psychological harm. But I would believe that even if um, the provision were extended to other types of harm, I I, I couldn't imagine that this would preclude uh, the, the the UCPD. Um, so uh, the, the, the two would certainly uh, coexist because the UCPD um, uh, has a, a number of further um, you know, qualifications, a number of further uh, conditions that need to be met for a commercial practice to be unfair under the UCPD. And that is an entirely different uh, legal framework. I simply cannot imagine that uh, the one would preclude the other. But of course, Gabriele knows, is the only one on this panel who really knows what uh, the Commission had in mind. Exactly. And so maybe he might, may also shortly answer if, if he agrees with that, which I think he should, uh, or, or not. It sounds like I don't have a lot of uh, <laughs> option. <laughs> but uh, no, I certainly... Well, I, ne I may know a little bit more about Article 5, but I certainly don't know as well UCPD as Cristiano or any other panelist here. But essentially, the thinking behind the Article 5 is indeed to craft those provisions as narrowly as possible. And for a number of reasons, um, first of all, indeed, there are other provisions in EU law which could apply. I mean, UCPD is an example 
could be interpreted also depending on how it's interpreted. It could fit certain situations. But also there is another important act which is not yet uh, fully completed and is the Digital Services Act. So the Digital Services Act is already out there. It contains a number of provisions for advertising, targeted advertising, not necessarily also commercial. And so the provisions of the DSA have been carefully also scrutinized by us to make sure that indeed we do not necessarily create a, a conflict with those provisions. And, uh, and we think that as at least as when it comes to commercial uh, advertising or financial harm, uh, the, the DSA is definitely a, a, the instrument to look at. Thank you. Uh, of course, the devil is also in the application, and we have a very interesting question uh, uh, put by, by uh, Federica Casarossa. She says, how the AI Regulation Act will interact with the cybersecurity rules? Is it envisage a coordination between the role of the AI board and ENISA if overlapping issues emerge? And Jens Peter Schneider seems to be up to answer that question. Probably not really answer, but uh, to be delighted uh, to be informed about another agency which is on board. Yeah, and uh, that that highlights my point that uh, in general, in digital law, you have quite often the, the situation that so that it covers or is covered by so many uh, legislative uh, proposals and acts, and for that reason, also various um, competencies of various authorities are on board. And uh, so there's a real need for this kind of uh, coordination. And as we already mentioned, the Digital Services Act, uh, it has some very strong and interesting notions on AI or at least possible AI uh, instruments on board used by platforms. And there's also some sort of risk management procedure behind that. And so it's very, very interesting and important to know which procedure applies to which sort of uh, AI usage. And so just thank you for highlighting this topic. Thank you very much. And and the next question, I'm not sure whom should answer it, but uh, um, someone asked about uh, the purpose of the risk management system in Article 9. Does it just aim to ensure compliance with Title 3, Chapter 2, for those who know already by heart this uh, uh, AI Act, or is it about managing all sorts of risk, including risk to fundamental rights? And so uh, this is some structure. I don't know, Mark, if, if you think you, you might answer that question or whether it's Jens Peter or, of course, Gabriele. But, uh, I, of course, we would all ask questions only to Gabriele, but we have a panel, so <laughs> the idea is to have answers by others. No, no I think it's, it's better uh, for Gabriele to, to, yeah, to okay. that question because uh, I would just give a, a kind of... Um, point of view of somebody who, who, who was not involved in drafting and I think the uh, the question is uh, much more on the purpose of the of article 9 in minds of the drafters of the regulation. So Gabriela you have the floor. Yeah um, in fact article 9 is sort of the chapeau article of the requirements and so it's indeed the article through which the older requirements need to be read. And in fact, this concept of risk management system is something that uh, is fairly common in product safety legislation. And it's really sort of an obligation for, for the provider to, to really assess when he develops a certain products, to assess all the risks that its products can um, produce, and then uh, make sure that he follows a you know, stepwise approach in terms of managing managing that risk uh, and identifying so risk management measures. So yes, uh, the purpose of that risk management system is to ensure compliance of the product with the requirements. And the risks are potentially all those risks that could be sort of, uh, that are covered by the legal act. So both for safety and, and fundamental rights or so social risk and uh, safety risk as uh, Christiane was mentioning before. 
Thank you. But since you have the mic, maybe you should keep it because I, I would like to hear you on the issue of uh, a free flow of data and, and the impact and the interface with, with the AI Act because we have two questions about the free flow of data. And of course, Susanna Navas came with that important point and the interaction between IP, free flow of data and, and the uh, private governance of, of data through contracts. And, and so how do, you, uh, how do you respond to that issue and saying, okay, on the one hand, uh, the commission wants to enhance the competitiveness, but on the other, there's no free flow of data and, and maybe the AI uh, assessment here, AI Act might not get to the point uh, it wants to get to. Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I Susanna, you have... wanted to. Okay, good. Go, go ahead. No, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, no, sorry. go ahead. I have, That's fine. <laughs> I have envisaged some solutions, maybe, and okay. uh, a compulsory, a compulsory license, for instance, in favor to the private sector uh, for carrying out tax and data mining for commercial purpose. Uh, however, the uh, right holders um, should be compensated with a remuneration. This is a, a mechanism that is used in copyright law, for instance, would be also a good uh, solution. Also, data pooling arrangements to um, simplify the license transactions. And third, uh, data sharing intermediaries uh, in the line with the proposals of the um, uh, stated in the open in the Data Governance Act. And I would like also can imagine the creation of sectorial data spaces like the uh, European health data space. And this is also proposed in the proposal that we have, uh, this, we discussed now. Thank you. And thank you very much because these are important proposals and would they fit with the AI Act, Gabriele? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, indeed, I think Susanna said it, said it very well. I mean, the AI Act, is uh, a, a product legislation. So inevitably, we, we, we are sort of putting together legislation to, to address certain risks. So that is the rationale. There are certain provisions also where we clearly want to encourage the more supportive environment for businesses. And you, know, you, you may have noticed the chapter on support for uh, innovation, so the regular sandboxes, which are actually a novelty in, in EU law and uh, including also the, the provision providing legal basis for the further processing of personal data. So we think there are some elements that would, would certainly spur and support innovation. We are quite proud actually of that chapter. Um, at the same time, we have to acknowledge that uh, there are other acts like the DGA, which is mostly focused on really on, on facilitating that free flow of data and facilitating the, the sort of the raw material for AI to be developed. In addition to that, then there are of course a number of supporting measures which are part of the coordinated plan, which was adopted by the commission together with the AI proposal. And of course is everything that is not necessarily regulatory or normative in a strict sense, but more indeed in terms of supporting measures to, to, to facilitate the uptake and the development of the system, including uh, data spaces. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and of course, some of the proposal uh, just mentioned by Susanna are also part of the uh, ALI, ELI model rule project where uh, there's, a, there's a kind of framework uh, to try to implement this, uh, this uh, pooling system and also the free flow. Christiana, would you agree with that? Would that help? Yes, I definitely think that all the um, tools that have been mentioned are uh, important building blocks in an innovation friendly environment that um, enables the, the, the use of data. And um, it's, it's exactly uh, and in particular those data sharing services, those data intermediaries that I think could be the key to uh, solving many problems which we are seeing at the moment and also this kind of tension which we always have between the need for a high level of protection on the one hand and uh, the availability of data on the other. Thank you very much. We have also in the chat, uh, I mean in the Q&R, uh, 
a lot of questions uh, dealing more with issues about the relation between data, ownership of data, and whether an algorithm owns the data or whether the person behind owns it. That goes probably a bit beyond what we have presented today, but there was a kind of simple, I mean, two, I still have at least time for two questions. One simple question, which might not be so simple, but is the link between the risk-based approach and the liability uh, 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 regime and whether they fit together or, or whether the EU is really going to uh, enlarge the liability regime in, in light of the AI Act because as Gabriele has shown in the various stages, uh, uh, you may have some of these algorithms that fall under the product liability regime, but some probably do not, at least not as it stands now. So what is the, the uh, interface between both? Uh, do you want to say something about that, Gabriele? Perhaps very briefly, and then I'll just use the opportunity to, to to perhaps launch the ball back to Christiane on this, um, <laughs> given her expertise and given uh, her work also on this point with the Commission. But I think indeed the, the links are currently being explored. And, uh, and I know there is, uh, this is not something we, we are dealing with directly because indeed we are dealing more with the horizontal framework, so the ex ante part, the exposed or the liability whether it's about the revision of the product liability directive or also other initiative on specific on AI, these have been in the works. And, um, and in principle, I think they are not necessarily strictly connected. Uh, that is also why the commission has decided to, to go forward first with this proposal and, uh, and let the second liability parts to be being uh, in the works later. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Christiana, do you want to add something on that? Since I gave the floor to Gabriele after you spoke, so now you have the right to reply. <laughs> well, I mean, in the documents that were published on the 21st of April, there's an announcement that we will see uh, draft proposals on liability issues in the last quarter of 2021 and the first quarter of 2022 and or. Um, so we're lo really looking forward to that. As we all know, there's been extensive preparatory work. We've had an expert group on liability and new technologies. We've had a, a commission report. Um, we've had a European Parliament proposal for a full-fledged regulation, which also takes that risk-based approach as suggesting um, strict liability for uh, a defined number of high-risk AI applications and enhanced tort liability for all other applications. So um, it, it, it's really fascinating times for everyone um, who works on liability law, but we, we don't really know what is going to be published ultimately at the end of this year or early next year. But we are very thrilled about it, I'm sure. Uh, and of course, when we speak about liability, we can also speak about criminal law. And, and there's a probably interesting question posed by Lorena Bermeyer Winter, but I must apologize. I'm not sure I understand enough of criminal law to be able to understand it, but uh, uh, this is a very technical uh, question. So probably I, I would suggest that Gabriele takes time after the webinar to, to answer Lorena, unless you have a straightforward uh, answer to, to that uh, interesting question about competence uh, of uh, uh, fixing fines, uh, penalties provided under Article 71, when it states uh, who infringes the regulation and also uh, uh, the role of the EPPO, which I don't know what it is, I must uh, acknowledge. But Gabriele, do, do you see the question? Yeah, uh, I think indeed it's a, it's a complex uh, question. Um, I think the EPPO is the European Public Prosecutor's Office. Um, the European Public um, when the state itself will infringe the regulation. Um, that is indeed a, a really good question. I think we'll, we'll need to check back on that. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And the last question is for Marc Clément, because uh, he said that, uh, you know, judges 
are not as clever as they, they should be or might be or whatever. And there's a question about the ju jurisdiction on AI usage and whether we need an upgrading judi judicial bodies with IT experts or specialist, specialized chambers. And maybe we could end with that question, uh, this webinar. So may maybe Marc Clement, you, you may answer that question, whether you think we should have an upgraded judicial body uh, not necessarily. I think that um, uh, the uh, technical issues are uh, already uh, uh, very important in many domains of uh, law. Uh, what is true is that the fact that you have um, technical documentation, technical assessments, and the capacity of, um, of having these documents available and experts uh, being able to look at them is a positive step because when, then uh, you have the possibility for uh, citizens possibly to, to challenge some uh, usage of, uh, of these techniques because they, uh, they can rely on some transparency uh, on the side of the uh, developers of the systems. But I, I, I really think that um, although uh, specialized uh, judges or experts um, uh, are not necessarily uh, needed as a specific body for judging these cases. I, I think that's something uh, judges have to take now into account and uh, to, to avoid what I presented, um, to uh, refrain from uh, entering into the details. If we want uh, a very correct implementation of all these things, we cannot just um, have um, uh, judges refraining to uh, analyze in in details what has been done. So uh, this is a this is a question I, I think this is, which is very similar to what is also uh, currently discussed in environmental law, uh, mm -hmm. where we have specialized body or the question whether specialized bodies are needed or not. I'm not necessarily in favor uh, of that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much also to all participants. We have come to the end of the time allocated for this first webinar. And I, I have to uh, uh, make a couple of uh, thanks. First, to the ELI Secretariat, because uh, uh, can you imagine one week after publication of this very important document and many, many hundreds of pages, we were able to organize and set this is a very interesting webinar, at least that's what I, I think uh, after having listened to all the panelists and also all the questions. And I hope that uh, all uh, people who attended uh, uh, enjoyed to have already the first fruits of these proposals at hand, thanks to uh, all our panelists. And, and so my deepest thank to all uh, five of you who took uh, uh, probably all the last week to deep into, of course, Gabriele does that for many years already, but for all four others <laughs> to take the time to deep into that in details, to be able to present today something that is, uh, that gives us already the first uh, uh, path uh, of our own thinking. And I'm sure we will have the uh, opportunity to come back on more specialized, more detailed aspects also in a near future. So in the name of all panelists, in the name of the European Law Institute, of course, I want to, to thank also all uh, attendees for being present and now, and, and of course, the panelists for all their great work uh, tonight. Thank you very much. Stay, stay, uh, stay safe, <laughs> stay safe and, and uh, uh, come back for our next webinar in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.